Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina, just about 45 minutes from here. And I come down on every Friday night to bring uh, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, uh, that's the express purpose that I'm out here, to make known the glories of Christ, to plead with you, to come to Christ. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 11, He said, Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, I'm here to warn you about the impending judgment, that there is a day of judgment approaching. The day in which God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. That He will judge them for the sins that they have committed against them. But friends, I'm here to offer hope as well. Yes, I want you to fear God. I want you to fear the wrath which is to come. But let that push you to embrace Christ. For He is the hope of glory. He is the hope of eternal life. For He has laid down His life for His people and He was raised on the third day. He is alive today and forevermore. He is the King of glory, the One through whom all things have been made and for whose glory they have been made. And friends, I come out here out of a care for your soul that you might believe upon Him, that you might believe the Gospel concerning Him. The Gospel is not primarily about you and I, although certainly it accomplishes the good of man and his salvation. But the Gospel is chiefly about God. In fact, the Scriptures are chiefly about God. In fact, all things are made for God. We are not the centerpiece of creation. God is. And all things have been made for His glory. That's why we find in Scripture especially amongst the New Testament writers, that they continually ascribed glory to God and gave glory to the Creator, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And friends, ultimately this evening, that is what I desire to do, is to bring glory to the triune God. As the Gospel is preached, the Gospel of the Trinity, for salvation has not only been accomplished by Christ, that is the second person of the Trinity, but the Father and the Spirit as well have taken part in this glorious epic redemption that has been accomplished for the people of God. And so may God be honored and exalted as the Gospel is preached this evening. Now the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this evening it's found in the book of Romans, and it is in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and I want to look at verses 40, uh, excuse me, 29 and 30. The Apostle Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he writes these words. He says, Is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith is one. This text speaks to the reality of God being a God who does not show partiality. He is impartial. He does not look upon the outward appearance, but upon what is in the heart. It is not as if there is a specific ethnic group that has access to God, but He has made Himself known to all men. He has revealed Himself in creation, and then He has revealed Himself specifically in the Scriptures. We find that the Bible is a consistent, unified testimony of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of Christ and how He came to accomplish redemption for His people. And Paul says that this God, this God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not merely for a specific group, but for whosoever will come. Whosoever desires, come. Christ says, for the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And oftentimes, bound up in the heart of man as it is fallen and sinful, we will often fall into the false notion that God is easier to access if you are belonging to a particular group of people. But that is a lie. For God is the God of both Jews and Gentiles alike. 
of both the black and the white, the rich and the poor, the famous and the not so famous, the unknowns. And that is what I seek to make known this evening. And he has made himself known salvifically in Scripture in the revelation of the gospel of Christ. In fact, that's how we know God. That's how we come into, into a right standing before God is by believing the gospel. And so ultimately, it's the gospel I seek to preach this evening. It's not merely this reality that God is available to whosoever will come to Him, regardless of what their background is, their socioeconomic background. But that's, that, is, that is not the breadth and length and height and depth of the truth of Scripture. It goes beyond that. God is found in Scripture and He reveals Himself in the Gospel. In the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And therefore, that is what I seek ultimately to preach this evening. And so the context here of Romans 3, just to make known uh, that, just to to cover that, Paul is speaking on salvation. In fact, he's thoroughly covered the work of Christ here in Romans 3. He says this concerning Christ in verse 25. He says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul says the, the cross of Jesus Christ was there to... Christ died to absorb the wrath of the Father. That's what uh, the word propitiation means. And then he says that displayed to us, as verse 26, that displayed to us the righteousness of God, that God does not sweep sin under the rug. And friends, you must come to grips with this reality. That Nahum 1 2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. But, friends, that wrath that was supposed to be put on the church was instead put on Christ at the cross of Calvary. And so, therefore, whoever repents and looks to Christ, who looks to the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world, the promise from the very mouth of God, as it were, is whosoever believes in Him is not judged. For He Himself has already been judged in their place. That's what Paul's speaking about here. Salvation in Christ alone. Then he says, verse 27, Where then is boasting? Is it, ex is, it ex is it excluded? Or he says, it is excluded. Excuse me, by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. So how do we apprehend Christ? How do we, how do we reap the benefits, as it were, of the work of Christ? It is belief in His finished work. It is faith. It's apprehending the work of Christ. It's clinging to Christ. The instrument that we grab hold of Christ with is faith, is confidence in the promises of God. And that's what Paul says there. He says, verse 28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And we must understand something in these two verses that I just read off in verse 29 and verse 30. Paul is addressing an issue that was prevalent in his day, and it's not so much of an issue in our modern day. And that was that amongst the early church, most of the believers at that time were Jewish. Very few were Greek. Very few were of Gentile origin. But as time went on, the church became predominantly Gentile. And sadly, there was a, a racial divide, we might say, between, uh, between even believers in the early church. But we do know from the book of Ephesians that that divide was done away with. And believers are united in Christ. That's one of the most beautiful things about being a Christian is that you have, un you, you have unity with people whom you've never met across the world who believe in the same Christ as you do, who believe in the same Lord as you do. And so that adds to the list of reasons one ought to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for life. So that brings us to the doorstep of verse 29. So let's consider that, of God being both the God of Jews and Gentiles. He says, verse 29, 
is God the God of Jews only? So he's asking the question, and he answers his question. This is one of uh, the characteristics of Paul's style of writing, is he asks these questions, and then he answers the questions he asks. So he asks that question. Well, the answer is obviously no, and that's what he'll, he'll answer in a moment. He says, is, is he not the God of Gentiles also? So he asks a second question here, and here's the answer. Yes, of Gentiles also. Of Gentiles also. And we could take this and apply to any group of people. As I mentioned earlier, the rich or the poor, the famous or the, the unknowns, the call of the gospel is still the same. The call of the gospel is still the same. The call to discipleship, the call to self-denial is still the same. Jesus' words have not altered. They do not change from person to person. They are objective. The truth of Scripture is objective. It's not subjective. It's not relative. It's not according to what we feel or what we desire. It is objective. And the call is that we are to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses daily and to come after Christ. Jesus said in Luke 14, He said, So then none of you can be my disciples who does not renounce all of his own possessions. And that's not just speaking of material possessions. It's beyond that. It's, it's any claim to a righteousness before God that we can procure. See, many people who go to church don't understand this reality. And that's why most of them are going to hell. Is because they think that they have something that they can offer up to God as the basis for their entrance into heaven. As their right standing before God. But Scripture says that God is jealous for the glory in salvation. That God is jealous to receive the glory in salvation. And so He has so ordered it to be all of grace from beginning to end. And that's why the call that Christ gives is one which says you must renounce all your possessions. You must say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. You must let go of your self-righteousness as we all have in, intrinsically built into us. We have that in us, friends. We have that bent to try and mend our broken standing before God by our religious performance, but it cannot come about by such things. In fact, 500 years ago, something incredible happened in Europe a man by the name of Martin Luther, a German uh, monk, took his 95 theses and nailed them to the castle church door in, in Wittenberg, Germany, and thus sparked the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. This October 31st was the, to the date anniversary of that historic event. And one of the, one of the bulwarks of the Reformation, one of the, one of the cries of the Reformation, of the Reformers, John Calvin, of Martin Luther, of John Knox, John, Roger, John Rogers, and all the other Johns, all these other reformers, these men of renown, one of, the, one of the things that they stood upon was a Latin phrase, and it was solus Christus, which means Christ alone. That one, one, in order for one to have a right standing with God, it must be through Christ alone. For there is only one mediator between God and man, and it is the man Christ Jesus. All other so-called religious leaders who came before and who came after are liars. They are liars, and Christ is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He said there in John 14, 6, He said, No man comes to the Father but through Me. Not through a priest, not through the Pope, not even through a pastor, not through penance or prayers, but through Christ. He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, as we find in the book of Hebrews. So you are not only bid to come to Christ, not only are you pleaded with by Scripture, but you are also commanded. It is a command from the mouth of Christ to repent and to believe the Gospel. But going back to the text, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, well actually verse 30, or verse 30 is what we're looking at now. He says, Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. In other words, as I said, it does not matter your background or where you were born or where you came from. 
God justifies sinners the same way, and it is by faith. Faith. What is faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. We, we grab hold of the promises that God has given in Scripture, and we say that my soul is built on this reality, that God has said it and it will come to pass. In fact, going back to what I was just saying a moment ago concerning the Protestant Reformation, those reformers, John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Knox, John Rogers, and men later on of the Protestant tradition also had another phrase that they stood upon, and it was sola fide. And it means faith alone. It's a Latin phrase. It means faith alone. And so they stood in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church, which said that you have to be justified by God by faith and works. Your, your, your trust in God, but also some of your performance, some of your deeds. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church has the, the damnable system of the seven sacraments, if you've ever heard of them. And in order for one to escape purgatory, escape hell, and go directly into heaven when they die, is they have to perform these sacraments with the utmost precision. In fact, Martin Luther, who was a German monk himself, was for years enslaved in this system of works righteousness. He said that he feared God, but not only did he fear God, he began to hate God. He began to have a hatred for God, who punishes sinners for their sin. Because no matter how hard he tried, no matter how hard Martin Luther tried, and, and the life of a monk was not an easy life. It was rigorous. It was vicious. And Martin Luther would later on say that it, it was so intense upon his physical state that he had medical issues for the rest of his life because of his life of being a monk. But he tried, he tried, he tried to earn salvation by his work. And he was honest with himself. He was honest before God. And he could not do it. He could not work enough. And therein lies man's problem. He cannot perform sufficiently as God demands of him. And you know this. Not only do the Scriptures tell you this, but the light of nature in you tells you this. Your conscience in fact, the word conscience is derived from Latin. It means with faith. I'm, so, I'm sorry, with knowledge. With knowledge. Because that's where we get the word science from. It means knowledge. We are, we are given knowledge intrinsically of right and wrong. And our consciences tell us what is right and what is wrong. We know it is wrong to lie, to murder, to disobey parents. We know that intrinsically. We don't have to be told that. Why is that? Because we have a conscience. And your conscience tells you that you cannot perform as God demands of you. And therefore, your trust has to be in another. It has to be in the one who performed sufficiently for sinners, who kept the law of God, who died as a ransom for sin, who was three days later raised, and who sits in glory to intercede on behalf of those for whom He died. God will justify them both by faith. There is a great need for this, friends. If you are honest before God, if you are honest with yourself, you will agree to this reality. You will agree to this scriptural truth that it must be by faith. It must be by faith in the surety. In the one who secures assurance of eternal salvation. Who secures salvation for sinners. Faith does not save anyone. It is the object of faith that saves. It is the object of one's faith that justifies. You could have faith in whatever you so desired, but it wouldn't save you if it's not Christ. If it's anything but Christ, you'll be damned. You'll be lost. It has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Dear friends, you must see this. You must grasp this. You must comprehend this. That you must approach it, God, on His terms, through His Son. But who is this God? I mentioned earlier, He is a righteous God. A just and holy God. A God whose wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. As Romans 1.18 says, he is also gracious and compassionate. We see that. You see that, friends. 
especially those of you who know not the Lord Jesus Christ, God right now is showing mercy to you and grace, common grace, general grace, bestowing it upon you. It is a great wonder, a great measure of mercy from God that we ourselves are not in hell, that you are not in hell, sir. It is a great mercy of God and it is not to be trampled underfoot. God is so holy. Holy means sanctified, sacred, set apart. And that is what God is. He is holy. In fact, what does God tell the Jews in the Old Testament time and time again? He commands them to be holy. It's not optional. It's a must. All throughout the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, they are commanded to be holy because God is holy. God is also love. We know that from 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. But these attributes of God, friends, don't clash with one another. They're not as if they are in disagreement. They are in perfect unity. God is a God of order and unity, not disunity, not chaos. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is not a God of disunity, but of unity. And friends, God in His holiness, in His righteousness, has given His law, His Ten Commandments. And you yourselves, if you have been raised perhaps in a Christian atmosphere, will perhaps recall some of these commands that God gave. And they were first given in Exodus chapter 20 as Moses was upon Mount Sinai and the glory of God appeared there and Moses was given these commands by God to relate to the people of Israel. But it was so much more than that. This was a reflection of the eternal character of God. They're just not arbitrary rules that God came up with. No, no. These show us the character of God. For we find, for example, God says you shall not lie there in Exodus 20. In verse 16, He says that. We also find that God says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. Or you shall have no other gods before Me. That's verse 3. Why does God give these laws? He is a jealous God. He desires to be worshipped. He hates murdering. He's not a murderous God. He hates things like abortion. Because He's not a murderous God. He hates lying because we know from the book of uh, Hebrews it is an impossibility for God to lie. You see, friends, these show us the character of God. People don't realize that. But you must. You must realize that. Psalm 19, 7, The law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect, without error. The law of God not only shows us His holiness, but our unholiness, our impurity, our sin, in light of God's holiness. For ask yourself, friends, have I lied? Have I stolen? Have I worshipped anything, any God other than the true God? If so, you've broken God's law. You've broken the holy law of God. You say, perhaps, oh, I've never murdered anybody. Jesus says in Matthew 5 that if you have anger in your heart, towards someone, then God regards it as murder. He sees you as the, same, as the same. In fact, we know from that same chapter that Jesus says that you're guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Have you committed adultery? You say no. Jesus said in Matthew 5 again, See, Jesus t took the law and just simply applied it to the heart and said, no, these things not only apply to your outward behavior, but the inward reality. What's in you, your heart, God sees your heart, friends. He sees your mind. He sees the thoughts that come in your mind. You must realize this, that God's eyes see all things. It's not as if there are certain things that we can hide from Him, for He is omnipresent, all places, all places. 
all-powerful, all-knowing. And so Jesus says there in Matthew 5, if a man looks at a woman with lust for her, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. That's adultery, friends. So, therefore, and it's not only that you yourselves are in this state, but I put myself in this category as well. By default, I am right there with you, friends, and you with me on this equal plane of condemnation before God. We're born in this state. We know from Psalm 51 that David writes, In sin did my mother conceive me. Not from birth, my friends, but from conception, the moment that our lives began. And that is true, life begins at conception. Human life begins at conception. God has always said that. It was only recently science discovered that and caught up with the Bible. What Scripture had already said was both scripturally, spiritually true and scientifically true. But friends, we are in this state by default before God of being at enmity and at war with Him. It's interesting, people look around the world and they really don't understand why is this world such a mess? And you know, pe pe uh, pe people who are involved in politics will, will say, well, it's issues with politics. People who are involved in money will say it's issues with economics. And even religious people sometimes say, well, people need to get, people just aren't correctly religious. Is that it? No. It's that the ma man's heart is radically wicked and depraved. He hates God, he hates his fellow man, he loves sin, and he will not come to Christ. Listen to the way Paul describes the lost soul in Romans 1. He says, verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do, them, do the same, but also give heartily approval to those who practice them. Friends, this is the state of man. And because of it, God holds him accountable. And therefore, we are all condemned to hell without hope by default. The place that Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, as a place of outer darkness, the place of an unquenchable flame where the enemies of God will eternally reside. And that is hopeless, truly is. But friends, I come out here bearing a message of hope, the message of hope. I did not merely come to make known the bad news, but to only make known the bad news so that I might make known the good news, which is that God being rich in mercy. Friends, God is rich in mercy. As Paul says in Ephesians 2 there, He has a great love for His people. It is a selective love. It is an exclusive love but it is an eternal, redeeming, saving love. We know Paul says in Ephesians 5, he tells the men in Ephesus, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Friends, Jesus has a great love for His people. See, we must understand this, that before the world was made, the Father chose a people to Himself. He set aside His church whom He would save. As Paul words it in Ephesians 1, he says, In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace. God did that out of His great love. And He commissioned His Son. He covenanted with the Lord Jesus Christ before the world was made concerning this people that Christ would come and die for them. Jesus' death wasn't a surprise. It was the plan of God. It was something that was in the mind of God from eternity past. In fact, we might say it was 
It was the centerpiece. It is the centerpiece of history. The world, all things have been made simply as the stage. And here we have the gospel of Christ, the cross of Calvary, placed forth on this stage and in the spotlight at the centerpiece. The focus. It, it, it's, it's, it's the focus of all things, my friends. It's the point of all things. Christ, His glory, His gospel. In fact, if you live for yourself or for your glory... Or for, your, or for someone else's glory, other than Christ, you're living for a worthless existence. In fact, it's interesting, we have people who are just so depressed, we have high suicide rates, people are living hopeless lives, they're living hopelessly, because they don't live for anything eternally. What are they told? What are they told in public school? That they're a bag of stardust, evolved from a bunch of primordial soup, and the world has no purpose, no meaning, no end, no trajectory, no consistency really, because there's no promise of tomorrow in a godless worldview. But here we find the gospel of Christ gives hope to the lost. For when Christ, when the, when the fullness of the times came, Jesus Christ, at the right time, that the second person of the Trinity, fully God, the God of glory came down and veiled His glory and lived among men. He fulfilled the law for His people. That is, He lived as, as exactly as God demands of us. Think about that. God demands of you and me to keep His law perfectly, but we can't do it. So Christ comes in and keeps it perfectly. He loves the Lord as God with all His heart, mind, soul, and strength, and He loves His neighbor as Himself. What did the Lord Himself say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17? He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill it, and He did just that. We know that two chapters earlier uh, of Matthew 3, we find that at the baptism of Jesus, the Father proclaims from heaven in a loud voice, audibly, He says, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased and he was indeed and then to speak of the peak of Christ's humiliation we go to the cross for we find there that the son of God was nailed to that Roman cross and even before then he was beat he was spat upon he was made a public mockery we know that a, a Roman flogging a Roman scourging was so severe that typically, or at least sometimes, the people who received it wouldn't even make it to the cross alive. They would die before they made it there. In fact, it was so severe, they, they were supposed to give the recipient 40 lashes, 40 strikes, but they would do 39 because if they went over 40, there was almost a guaranteed death from the trauma, from the blunt force trauma. And then he's nailed to the cross. And upon that cross, something happened. The sin of the people of God was credited to the Son of God, to His account. He took ownership of the sins of the church and bore the wrath of the Father against their sin. He drained the reservoir of the Father's just and holy indignation against the church, against the sins of God's people. See, here's the thing. There's a dilemma in Scripture. God cannot be a holy God and forgive sin. He can't. Otherwise, He would cease to be holy. Yet it says in Scripture, He's merciful and He does forgive sin. That's resolved in the Gospel because we see that God puts His own Son forth as the propitiation. And so the sin of God's people is punished. It is publicly punished. And the wrath of the Father is absorbed. Listen to Isaiah 53. This was written 700 years, seven centuries before Jesus was born by the prophet Isaiah. Verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. Verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. Hey, 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 can Jesus save thoughts? Yeah. 
because she's a thought. Scripture says God will not be mocked. Oh, no, no. I said, oh. She's a thought, but uh, yeah, like, Jesus got to save her. Yeah. I can give you a, would you like a gospel track? No, she sucks dick for money. But, <laughs> yeah, oh wait, wait, what? I, would you like a gospel track? Yeah. Good news of Jesus Christ? Yeah, Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Oh, shit, I'm about to play this in my car. Hey, but you about to get some Jesus in you. <laughs> Here you go, sir. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Oh, Thank you. Absolutely. Oh Lord, save those sinners. <clears throat> so, not only did Christ die, but He was raised on the third day. He's alive today and forevermore. See, the Father vindicated Him, cleared Him, because He didn't die as a guilty man. He didn't die for His own sin. He had none. He died for the sins of His people. So the Father vindicates Him. Christ was raised bodily. What a glorious validation upon Christ's ministry and His work. And 40 days later, Jesus ascended bodily into glory and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there He reigns and rules as the King of glory. And the call of the Gospel, the command is simply this, to repent and believe the Gospel. Repentance is simply seeing our sin. We recognize it and we, we endeavor. We endeavor to flee it, to run from it. If you think you can come to Christ and cling to your sin, you're not fit for the kingdom. Repentance is a turning from sin and, and then faith, that's where faith comes in. Faith is simply turning to God and believing the promises of God. What do we find in Abraham? In Abraham's own life, who was is put forth in Scripture as a, as a model for how we are to believe in God. What does Abraham's life tell us? Romans 4.3 says, For what does the Scripture say? And then Paul quotes out of Genesis 15.6, he says, for Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified before God by this one reality. He believed the promises of God. That's faith, my friends. And I want to tell you, repentance and faith are not things you can muster up in you. They're not an act of the free will of man because man's will is bound to only sin. Repentance and faith are graces. They are both given to the sinner by God as a gift. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, God, If perhaps God might grant them repentance, they are gifts from God. And so that confirms what we read in John 1, where it says, For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Layer upon layer of grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who repent and believe on Christ, we know from Luke 24, they will for, be forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future, and credited with the righteousness of Christ. They will be justified. Friends, you need to be justified before God. And that it only is accomplished by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That is only accomplished by throwing yourself on the mercy of God as it is revealed in His Son. For those who repent and believe, the Father regards them as having lived Jesus' life. You have to understand this. And this is something that will not be preached in churches here. That God regards the sinner as if he lived Jesus' life, if they believe in Christ. It's because what did he do at the cross? He looked at Christ as if he was a sinner. He treated Jesus as if he was a lawbreaker. And so in salvation, if a sinner comes to Christ, God looks at them as if they lived Jesus' life. He looks at them as if they kept the law as Christ did. Because Christ was looked upon as if he lived their life. There's an exchange that happens. Jesus takes my sin upon his shoulders and bears the wrath due unto it. And then... He gives me the garment of His perfect righteousness as a gift of grace. It is all by grace. Unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense, we might say. And I want to say this too. For those who are in Christ, for those who have been saved by Christ, they have a new heart with new desires. You will not continue on living the way you did before. If God saves a sinner, they are changed. They're no longer a sinner. They're a fellow citizen with the saints and are of God's household. They now have a new nature and a new heart with new desires. They now delight in God and in His truth. And they will not live as though they did before. And for those of you who are Christians, 
The gospel is for you, brethren, for you to feed upon, to rest in, and to proclaim to this lost and dying world. It is all by grace, free grace, so that God might receive the glory. Listen to what Paul says. Be attentive to this in Romans 11. What does Paul say there? He ascribes glory to God. He says, verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who was first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And amen. You who are lost, come to Christ. You who say you know Christ, look at your life. Has God done a work in you? I don't care what you say with your lips. Has God done a work in you? And if not, you need to be saved. And if so, praise be to God. If you are saved, proclaim the gospel to this lost and dying world. So we've seen here in Romans chapter 3, verses 29 and 30, that God is the God of both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles alike. We have seen that God is holy and we deserve hell for our sin, but Christ died for sinners, and all who believe on Him will be saved by His grace and for His glory. To Jesus Christ be all glory and all things forever. Amen and amen.